the just the uh, we have still to work on the uh, cost issue, how to make it more uh, accessible under that point of view. And of course, it requires, especially in the case of PCR, that we have a good uh, uh, capacity uh, in the laboratory where we are going to perform it. So today, I think that LAVA, we are going to see something, right? And regarding the disease management of uh, MLN, just to conclude about this, um, the, the situation, as I started to mention, is pretty complicated by the presence of vectors, many hosts, two viruses, um, all the management that uh, the farmers and the, and the seed industries has to do for multiplying seed, etc. Last week, where um, this paper was published, um, and I found this excellent picture. It is very uh, uh, self-explanatory of what really the management of this disease means, where we have so many, um, so many components, all of them together, uh, that, uh, that we need to take care of for controlling the pathogen in the field, the disease in the field. And my colleagues later will, uh, will discuss this. But just to show you that um, we need, to be, we need to be quite aware of the complicated issue we are facing, and hopefully uh, that we can put in place measures that we can put in place, place are taken for controlling the spread of the pathogen. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, uh, any questions? I'm glad to, to answer. Yes. A comment. Yes. Um, sorry, I would like to know the agar. You didn't mention the agar we use. During the agar we use, whether PDA, nutrient agar, you just said the selective agar, what agar we going to use? Okay, the agar, the selective agar, is it PGA during the test, yes? The, the agar play yeah. test, it depends on which pathogen you want to target. Okay. So uh, it can be PGA for certain fungi. It can be uh, another media that is more selective for other pathogens. That ca comes in the literature, so there are several. If you are isolating bacteria, even more specific media are available for, for instance, uh, Clavibacter michiganensis in maize. It is a specific medium called CNS. Mm -hmm. So, but you can find that on the literature or I can give you information or on the manual that I showed you is listed. Okay. Yeah. And secondly, do we test both the leaves and the seeds? Sorry. Both the leaves and the seeds or just how do we do this? How do we test them? Just the, is it, do we test the seed leaves alone or just the seeds? Or do we test both of them together? Okay. You will have, you'll have more time to actually do these things in the afternoon. What kind of uh, agar and how to do the seed testing. You'll have opportunity this afternoon in the lab. Okay, so that will clarify your doubts. Because all these questions are related to the practical aspects. So when you do it, it becomes very clear. Okay. There will be more details. Yeah. Can I speak? My name is uh, Shola Odedara. Please, in one of your slides, you mentioned on the ideal way of uh, testing for sealed health. You mentioned something like matrix. Matrix. Then in brackets, we put uh, for seed leaves, treated seeds, something like that. So please, will you expantiate more on that? I don't really understand what you mean. By matrix? Under the slide, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we are talking about ma matrix? Yeah. Under ideal, well, it's a technical. The ideal seed health test, yeah? I think it's there. 
the number two, yeah, this one. The number two, yeah, yeah, points. Yeah, this is just an example. It should be a comma between this. The matrix is what you use for testing. In this case, is a seed. It can be leaves. It can be a stem. It can be a root. It can be a tuber. It can be the part plant that you need for detecting the pathogen. Is that what you would like to know? Oh, what do you mean by oh, it's a technical seed word um, uh, to, yeah, it's a, a general way of expressing pa plant part. It could have been plant part instead okay. of matrix. Yeah, I now understand. Sorry for that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm sorry for that. That's fine. I think. Um, okay. Any more? Okay, no further questions. Thank you. Um, Yeah, um, following on with Monica's talk, a, a very quick overview on uh, the viruses. Monica has very detailedly presented a, the various list of pathogens, important viruses that are affecting maize and the ways we can detect it, and some of the sensitive issues that we need to take in, uh, into consideration while testing the, the seed for pathogens, especially for uh, distribution or for cultivation in the fields. So this talk is aligned to the same subject, but just gives an idea about what are the important viruses that are present in, uh, that are affecting maize and, and how we detect them. And since we have a short time, it is just a, a quick overview. Practical aspects of how we do diagnostics is going to be dealt in the afternoon. So if you have any specific questions, on the method, we can discuss in the afternoon. If there is any something regarding the, the virus per se or disease things, we can definitely discuss here. And many of, of the audience here are from IITA, so they know what we do at here. Just as a, a, a short reminder, the part of the things that we do relates to the maize um, seed health and maize virology. Um, we facilitate as part of the Gemplasm Health. We act as an internal uh, quality monitoring, especially for seed health. And we work very closely with the quarantine agency when it comes to the international distribution. We established all the methods that are necessary for seed health testing for all our mandate crops. And uh, these details can be found on our uh, web page that is listed here. And in addition to Gemplasm Health, where we deal with the seed health aspects, in virology diagnostics, we have the necessary facilities for developing diagnostics. In most instances, we establish our own diagnostic protocols. And sometimes it is necessary because many of the pathogens that we deal are very unique to the African region and uh, commercial diagnostics are rare. In some cases, we still prefer to use our own diagnostics even when their commercial tests are available, mainly because of the cost aspect. When you have your own, if you had to eat in a hotel every day, you had to pay more. But if you cook in your home, it's much cheaper, right? Ah. 
I see a lot of students here. When we, when we keep talking about pathogens, pathogens, maybe it is good to tell them what are we dealing when we say pathogens. Just one slide. When we talk about mates pathogens, we literally deal with everything from uh, bacteria, fungi, um, phytoplasma, viruses. There are no viroids or other uh, type of subviral agents reported in uh, maize. Not all of them spread through seed. They can affect the plant, but when it comes to seed, there is only three particular agents that goes through it. It's mainly fungi, bacteria, and, uh, and viruses. And the reason why we rely on diagnostics, Monica has, has very clearly mentioned the advantage of using agar plating method. That's one way of diagnosing, actually allowing the pathogens to grow, and then after, based on the growth, you can detect. But in some cases, that may not be possible. You can't cultivate pathogens. Or in some cases, use of diagnostics actually reduces the time it takes to know whether the particular seed or seed lot or plant is infected by pathogen. So there are numerous advantages. And uh, in this slide, we, I just indicated the purpose of diagnostics. We use, in our routine business, to just to know presence or absence, whether the particular pathogen is present or no. And sometimes we use the diagnostic tools for quantifying how much is present. If it is present, how much is present. And the same tool can be used in a different context. Under research context, the, the way you use the diagnostics can be different. We can use for routine for quarantine monitoring, which is where the, the established test place comes a very important and the seed certification, both for domestic as well as for international trade, field surveillance and pest risk assessment. If you are looking for areas to identify where there is no pest free zones, we still use it. And also for baseline studies. If you want to understand what is the threshold of the particular pathogen in its situations, you can use it. And trade. So th this is just a, a few, but you can use diagnostics wherever you think there is a need. So. It's, they don't have just one particular use. The use it depends on the, the user. So we use, in our routine ways, we use for pest detection, not only for pathogens. Sometimes we use diagnostics for identifying insects, both at the larval stage, eggs, and even uh, adults. And also weeds, sometimes to know what kind of weeds are there. Foodborne toxins, although we are not dealing that subject, mycotoxins. We can detect using diagnostics in the seed. And for quality, especially for, for instance, if you are doing uh, exporting material, you need to certify that the seed lots are free from pesticide residues. So that's, again, you can use diagnostic tools. There are numerous ways, depending on who you are, how you can use the diagnostics. For instance, researchers basically use the diagnostics mainly in the context of the research question, like, I want to know what is present in it. When it comes to quarantine agency or regulators, they basically use the diagnostics to detect the known, known pathogens, because they already have the target well determined. When it comes to industry, once again, the industry uses for the known uh, targets to ascertain that the product that they are producing is free from the pathogen. So the context varies depending on the, the type of stakeholder we are dealing. And this one, this particular workshop, we are mainly targeting the regulators and the seed industry. The advantage in this both cases is you don't have to worry about standardization of diagnostic, development of diagnostics, because that is done already by the researchers as part of the R&D. When it comes to maize, that's a, a kind of background. For maize, in Africa, there are a number of pests and pathogens. There is a striga, which is a weed. Uh, we, we have fungal diseases, insects, and viruses. When it comes to seed health and seed transmission, only we don't have to worry about, about weed. It can be risky if the processing is bad. We don't have to worry about the insects. But the main thing is the seed-borne pathogens, like fungi and uh, viruses. As informed by Monica. For maize, there are more than 20 different viruses reported. 
Some of them are very well characterized. Some, they are just names. We don't have much background. Um, and not all of them are distributed everywhere. Some few viruses are present pretty much globally, and some viruses, they're very much restricted to some parts of the world, or in some cases, just one or few countries. Almost all the viruses that were reported to infect maize are transmitted by insect vectors. Remember, maize is seed. It is, it's not a clonal crop. If there is no vector, automatically the virus eliminates by itself. There is no more succession from one generation to another. And this aspect is very, very important um, to understand the disease, uh, how the disease perpetuates in the field. Although there are 20 viruses reported to infect maize, there are only three which are known to be reported to spread through the seed. This is maize dwarf mosaic, maize chlorotic mortal, high plains virus, and it's a kind of unconfirmed study on sugarcane mosaic seed transmission. Only these four, three of them have been confirmed, one suspect. So when we are doing for seed health testing, we don't have to worry about all the 20 viruses. We just only have to focus on four. And for instance, if we had to do seed health testing in Nigeria, which one do we target? Would anybody like to guess? None. Because maize chlorotic mortal is not present here. If you're doing seed production, you don't have to worry about that. High plains virus is not, not known to occur in Africa. And maize dwarf mosaic is recognized in East Africa, but not yet in uh, West Africa. So you need to understand the context. If you impose yourself that we need to test for all the viruses that are known to affect in maize, well, it is good in principle, but then it is going to add a lot of cost to your unnecessary cost to your monitoring process. Just some pictures. Another complication with all these diseases is that the maize, the symptoms mainly appears on the leaves. And depending on the kind of virus infection, stage of infection, it can also affect the plant growth, height. Otherwise, mostly it causes a kind of mosaic symptoms. They're not always specific to one particular virus. Main streak causes very classical symptoms, but sugarcane mosaic and maize dwarf mosaic, all these causes symptoms which are indistinguishable from one to other. And this is um, maize yellow stripe virus, which is mainly reported from the northern Africa. It is transmitted by uh, leaf hoppers. Um, uh, it's, it belongs to a different group of virus called tenuai. It causes extreme stunting, as you can see here. Extreme stunting. Once the virus get, uh, once the plant get infected, it almost become rosetted. There is no more height, and most often such plants eliminate themselves. They don't produce any seed. We don't have to worry about seed transmission in that case because there is no cob formation. Uh, maize streak, which is the number one uh, virus disease of maize, restricted only to Africa and the offshore islands of uh, African continent. It's an endemic disease. Whereas wherever maize is grown, there is a maize streak. The incidence can vary. It is transmitted by leaf hoppers. And this virus is not seed transmitted. There is no seed transmission for this virus. And there are certain other conditions. For instance, if you look at this plant, these symptoms look like a kind of virus infection. But actually, it is caused by insect feeding. Um, so when you do the routine scouting, and especially with all this hype on this emerging diseases, latent, I mean, the, the new diseases, we can get confused that this may be another new virus. But sometimes there, is, there are other factors which also cause the symptoms which look like um, virus symptoms, but they are not. And there are some other virus diseases which are less studied. For example, this is a good example here, maize white line mosaic. Mm, which was reported from uh, US in 1980s. And it belongs to the same uh, family like maize chlorotic mortal. But then not much is known about this, how extent it is spread and what is economic importance. There are sporadic reports. Other than that, not much is known. And like maize chlorotic mortal, this virus is also known to be soil transmitted. Um, 
sugarcane mosaic. This is widespread in Africa. It is caused by potty virus. There is a lot of diversity. When we test for these kind of viruses, we need to be very careful what kind of diagnostic tools we are using to, to make sure that we are not missing the virus because of the diversity. And this virus is suspected to be C transmitted in maize, but then the reports are not absolute. There are a few other scenarios for which we don't have any causal agents confirmed, or it may be the symptoms which look like virus manifested by some other conditions. Like if you see some of this uh, situation here, it looks like a kind of mild mosaic here, clear stripes, both of which are caused by abiotic stresses. They are not because of viruses. One of the reasons why I'm showing these slides is that the part of the monitoring exercise that we do in both seed production fields as well as surveillance, which we do for the disease instance, unless we are very familiar about the symptoms, we were not able to do good justice, especially for estimating the incidence. Because incidence plays a very significant role in qualifying a particular field uh, for uh, seed use. And then the maize lethal necrosis, the new kid on the block. Um, Monica has already given a good description. We also talked about this yesterday. This is um, the most devastating disease. Uh, once the plant gets infected, it cripples, and in most cases the plant die, and if they survive, they produce malformed cobs, which are not edible or uh, saleable. As informed by Monica, there are two viruses associated with this sugarcane mosaic, which is transmitted by aphids, and then maize chlorotic mortal, which, is, which are transmitted by thrips, and also other, other insects are suspected in this. You've got to keep in mind that each of these viruses can cause disease on its own, but when they occur together, that's when the symptoms become more lethal. And maize chloridic mortal on its own can cause extreme severe mosaic and can cause very severe um, yield loss. Now here is the question. There's a, there's a picture on the slide. I've shown a lot of symptoms. Can you guess what is this virus disease now? It can be anything. It can, it can be any of those which I presented before. Okay, sometimes this is a tricky situation you, you would encounter. You can suspect, okay, this may be this. It can be sugarcane mosaic, it can be maize chloridic mortal, or it can be both, or it can be altogether different. How do you know? Even for the most familiar person who knows about the symptoms so confidently, can we able to tell that this is so-and-so virus just by looking at the symptoms? And then there is this issue. Yesterday, uh, we were talking about disease incidence and virus incidence. These are totally different aspects. A disease incidence, virus incidence. Disease incidence is where when you're actually counting the symptomatic plants, and the virus incidence is the one where you're actually testing and confirming the presence or absence of virus. They are not one and the same. And both have totally different application when it comes to seed certification both for uh, seed uh, industry or for quarantine monitoring when it comes to international exchange of uh, germ plasm. So these two are the critical issues that demands the use of diagnostic tools. Because when, you, when it comes to certification, you've got to be very sure what you're testing. Okay, you, there can be 100 viruses reported on a particular host Certification only considers those that need to be counted. Not everything that is countable should not be counted. Otherwise, what will happen? You would never be able to certify any field. There is no maize field that is free of any pest or a disease. There is always something occurs on the plants. So we need to be very careful what we want to look for and what we want to certify for. And this is where the knowledge on the, the kind of pathogens and the, the importance and all this comes into play. And this will then lead to establishment of diagnostics. So there is a whole lot of research involved in this to come to that kind of conclusion. So we don't have to worry about it too much, especially in this workshop context. And when it comes to diagnostics, we use these tools 
to confirm presence or absence during symptomatic stage. I showed a picture and asked, what is the pathogen? Okay, sometimes we can clearly see and we can suspect there is a virus in it, but we don't know exactly what it is. This is where the diagnostics can help us to confirm uh, the type of virus. Asymptomatic stage, there will be a stage where you cannot detect, you can't see symptoms, but the virus may still be present. Okay, seed for example is a good example. Most often you cannot see virus in the seed. Most virus, the, the virus may be present in the seed, but it doesn't show any deformity. It looks normal. So that's an asymptomatic stage. Or at a very stage, if there is incubation stage before the symptom manifestation takes place, and if you want to test for the confirmation, then again you need a diagnostics. And there are undetectable stages. For example, I mentioned seed germplasm is a good example, where the virus remains dormant. It only it start multiply, uh, it will multiply only when the seedlings start germinating. And sometimes the titers of the pathogens, when they are low, that's again, you can use diagnostics, very sensitive diagnostics that can help improve the detection. So there are, there are definite uses when it comes to certification and surveillance. And what kind of diagnostics? This is a huge, there is a, there's plenty of choice available. Okay, there are different, different types of diagnostics depending on the kind of facilities and the capacity and money available and the sensitivity. There's nothing like this is the best tool. Every tool has its own advantages and disadvantages. You've got to define what suits you the best. Okay? And the most critical factors that one should keep in mind when we select these diagnostics is sensitivity and specificity. When you use a diagnostic for a maize chlorotic motto, that particular diagnostic should not detect any other virus. Otherwise, it defeats the purpose. That's what we call specificity. And then the sensitivity, like what is the least amount of detection possible with that? Okay, so the more sensitive the tool, the better it is, so that you can you can increase the sample size for testing and pull the samples and test. Okay, or if even when it comes in very very low levels, you can able to detect. So these specificity and sensitivity are the most important aspects when we choose the diagnostic. And then comes the and the cost and the facilities. Okay, there may be a good diagnostics, but if you don't have right facility, you will not be able to adopt it. Then you need to choose something which fits best fits your setup. Or you need to change your setup so that you can adopt the diagnostic. So there are a lot of issues in this. And only the user should be able to make the decision. In some cases we can, the protocol can enforce what needs to be done, but in most cases it is the, it depends on the user. This is just an example the, about the sensitivity. Technically, there are methods available that can be, that can help detect even a single virus particle, for example, electron microscope. If you happen to be in the right grid, you can see single particle. Or biological assays, when you do mechanical inoculation, technically it is possible to detect even a single viable virus. So the detection limits vary depending on the type of, of assays you are using. This is just a matrix, just to summarize, how do you choose your diagnostics? The first question you would ask is, are you using diagnostics for detecting a known virus? In such situation, the type of diagnostic you are going to use it is a repetitive test like ELISA, the couple of examples which Monica said. You are going to use, because you know the target, maize chlorotic model, you know who, where the re reagent is available, you go and buy it and you start using it. So these are very specific tests when it comes to identifying known viruses. In case, if you are looking for something unknown, when maize chlorotic mortal entered into Africa, we don't know that virus exists in continent. So obviously, we were not looking for maize chlorotic mortal. We are looking initially for the known viruses, and then after a long time, we stepped down to testing for other viruses to see if we, if we can pick something. And we had used some advanced tools there. So this is where we go to the non-specific tools like use of generic primers, uh, genetic, uh, generic antibodies, electron microscope, or most recent next generation sequencing approaches, uh, which is like an assay which can tell both viruses that are present, uh, that are known as well as unknown. 
So it all depends on the context. But for us, for seed certification and surveillance, they are often target known. Okay, we don't look for unknowns. It's again a contextual, the question changes, you know. And this is just a few examples, the kind of assays that we have established here for the, the pathogens that we routinely handle that affect our mandate crops. This, this deals maize, banana, cassava, uh, cowpea, soybean, as well as, um, did I miss something? Yams. For all the viruses, uh, all the viruses that affect these crops that are present in Africa, we already have diagnostic developed here. And we shall develop a range of assays, not just one, depending so that you know, depending on the kind of facilities you have, you can adopt. The, we don't call PCR anymore complex, but uh, those who have visited quarantine uh, station here, you would agree that it's all contextual and subjective. What you what you call simple for me is uh, for somebody it is more complicated because it requires still facilities. So right from PCR to the lamp assays to ELISA those that can require a laboratory based and those that can be tested without lab like this setup you see here that's all you need if you want to do diagnostics the most advanced diagnostics a seven thousand dollar worth of equipment and rest are all locally available and you can move wherever you want this is a mobile lab and we have developed these assays for cassava viruses yam viruses maize as well as banana you would see this afternoon some of these things and this is a strip process which Monica also demonstrated. These are like pregnancy test kits. You can see results in just five minutes. Uh, Suresh is going to demonstrate in his presentation how they are using this kind of test for maize chlorotic motile in uh, East Africa. And then this example that we are seeing, now we are converting some of these assays into microchips that can be used using your mobile phone. These are small assays that can be linked to your mobile phone and this is literally fits in your pocket. Wherever you go, you don't have to worry about anything. So this, so this is, there is a flexibility. Once we understand the principle, have the reagents, we can mold them into different um, assay formats so that user can choose which one fits best and then he can adopt it. And each and every of these assay is tested for sensitivity and specificity, which is the critical criteria before you release any diagnostic. This is just one example for maize chlorotic motile that we have done. We have ELISA assays, LAMP assay, which you can identify based on the color change. You don't need any assay here. Take the leaf, wash it, take the wash, add into the reagents. Within 45 minutes, you would be able to know the result. And likewise, a multiplex assay for all the major maize viruses that affect, uh, that are present in Africa. And these assays are sensitive. Okay, they can go as as low as up to 10, more than a million dilution of, uh, of a nucleic acid extract from a leaf. So these are highly sensitive. And we are not just stopping there. Doing diagnostics in lab is one, and then having it used in the field is one, and then having the connection between the lab to field and the decision makers is another. So now we are also bringing this ICT element into this, so that you can combine both the wet lab diagnostics and the symptoms and the expert opinion together for decision making, quick decision making. And this is the system we are piloting together with uh, uh, the quarantine agency in Nigeria. And, uh, and, and Francis would talk about this, how they are using this kind of tools for maize chlorotic motto uh, subsequently. And this is the most recent development um, in our portfolio here. We are going for the non-invasive. All the examples that I have showed, it requires extraction, processing, testing. The new approach which we are now looking, it doesn't, it should not, it will not use any of this. It simply uses a, a device similar to your mobile phone or a device that can be attached to mobile phone. And just by taking the image, it will calculate and it will just tell what disease it is, what virus is present. And this is artificial intelligence based. We already have made a lot of progress with this, with cassava viruses, and we are doing the same thing for uh, uh, banana banchito. So we just got a new grant from the, the CGR challenge program, a uh, platform called uh, 
big data. They announced a, a competition called Inspire. And we submitted this idea and we got awarded for this one so that we can expand the range of pathogens that can be covered using this technology. The beauty of this is that now next time when you take an image using your mobile phone, you don't have to send it anywhere. You don't have to do diagnostic. You get the answer straight. Okay. So this is going to nullify many of the things that we are doing. For example, the wet lab diagnostics. They may become redundant in future. And such technology is coming not only for viruses, they are also emerging for fungal diseases, so that the seed can be just scanned under a kind of microscope, and the machine will tell which seed is infected. So things are changing. Down five years, we may be looking at completely different scenario when it comes to seed health certification. But for today, we still do the conventional method of testing by PDA agar and all that stuff. Okay. This is my last slide. Um, the essence that you should carry from this workshop is this. Number one, not all viruses that infect maize are transmitted through seed. There are very few which it actually spreads through seed. And visual detection of seed will not tell whether that particular seed is infected or not. Unlike on the leaves where you see symptoms, seed doesn't show anything. And this is another important aspect. Not every seed that comes out of the infected plant is actually infected. The percentage of transmission varies. Even for the known viruses, for example, maize chloridic myrtle or dwarf mosaic, the transmission, it can be zero under some circumstances too. It can be as high as more than 10%. So it is highly variable. There are so many circumstances um, that can influence this factor. So therefore, we cannot predict what would be the what would be the expected percentage seed affected in a given lot. So that is a big challenge when we do the sampling. Okay? Testing method of choice, what to do, which method, there, is so, there are so many options available, how are you going to narrow it down? So this is where it comes into type of virus, what type of virus we are looking at. And this is also very important, this is epidemiology. It's, you can't do seed test, testing blindly. You need to understand what is the circumstances. And in many cases, the, the seed testing precedes active field uh, growth inspection. Okay, Do you see something during the active field growth? That is a very important uh, right, guiding point for you when it comes to the seed lot testing, uh, seed testing uh, of the, all the seeds that were harvested from this, such fields. So you need to keep this point in mind. And then purpose of seed testing. What is the purpose? Are you testing for international exchange? Are you testing for domestic distribution? Are you dealing with an endemic situation where the disease is present but the virus is controlled? So there are, there are different scenarios. So this is where the policy makes a, a big um, impact. What is the purpose? and? Uh, what are the guides in choosing the assay? If you're doing for surveillance, that is, you want to know where a particular virus is present in a given geography, or how the extent of its spread, then you have a different question. Then accordingly, you have to choose your assay. If you're doing for seed health testing for uh, um, allowing the seed producer to sell his produce in the market, then you have a different question. Practicality, this is very, very important. You want to be as stringent as possible and as perfect as possible. But if it is going to cost as much as seed production cost, nobody is going to do it. So this is a very important thing. Practicality and convenience. Otherwise, you can have best protocol, but nobody would adopt. And finally, the protocol. In most cases, protocols are well established. Monica has mentioned about the seed health manual in her presentation for a, a, a well-defined pathogens for which we know the behavior very well we don't change the protocol even for after 20 years we still use the same because we know the behavior of the pathogen how it behaves for chlorotic motor which is a new kid on the block we are still trying to understand the the sea transmission aspect so we still don't have a, what we call as a standard protocol we are still we have a protocol, but we are still changing it. 
We are still changing it, fixing based on the knowledge, based on the evolution of the knowledge. So the protocol is very, very important. In most cases, it's, it's extremely important to adhere to the protocol for seed health testing. When it says this is the rule, you just have to blindly follow. No, don't ask questions. If you ask questions and try to tweak it, then the decision making will be completely biased. And this is just a, a notice that we are still going to spread some of these things as part of the CG-wide uh, phytosanitary awareness week that we are conducting on the week of 23rd to 27th October. There are more awareness activities that we are going to carry on, not only on MLN, but also other transboundary pathogens that are present in different parts of the continent where we are working, and how we are actually ensuring that the seed that we produce in our uh, centers as well as with partners, what precautions we are taking when it comes to movement from one country to country or within countries, the best practices we adopt when it comes to giving seed to the partners, etc. So this is an excellent opportunity. There is going to be uh, a lot of webinars, etc., streamed online. We are going to share the links with all of you because we have your email addresses. Okay, I stop here, and I would take questions one or two. If thank you very much, well, your presentation is quite uh, detailed. I just want to ask a simple question. The image that you talked about using the app on the phone, is it just the camera phone you use to snap it or the, or the other com uh, attachments? It's, it's a very good question. There is, there's going to be other attachments. Okay. Because the camera phone doesn't, it's a visual. Camera phone only takes picture in a visual light. Okay. This camera is a multispectral camera. It reads uh, hyper, hyperspectral images. Okay. And then there's an inbuilt software and we train this software to recognize the patterns and the wavelengths, etc. So it's a we had to we had to use nearly 10,000 photographs of a particular uh, disease, so that this we can the machine can understand the various symptom types. So yeah, but that that attachment is going to be very cheap. Yeah, we are making sure that it is it's going to be less than 10 dollars, so that people can buy it and. Uh, put it onto their mobile phones, and the software is going to be free, freely downloadable. When it is done, it is going to be available on Google Apps. Super good. So it's time for a break. Um, there is one presentation which is not going to be made uh, is by Abebe, because he already spoke yesterday, so uh, that talk is not going to be there. So we are still on time. So we break for the co coffee. And then we recon in at uh, 10.45. And all these presentations we are going to put in a Dropbox and we shared the link. So don't worry about copying these presentations. Yeah. Thank you.